Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3, we're going to begin in verse 1 in just a minute. Uh, we want to uh, express our condolences to uh, Miss Bonnie and her family in the passing of her mother uh, this week. Uh, very sorry for your loss. And I want to thank you all very much for uh, giving Gladys and I the opportunity to get away uh, for the last week. Um, Gladys is still gone. Uh, we had a good time visiting with Drew, and thank the Lord we didn't make any memories. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, we're grateful for that. Uh, Joshua chapter 3, and we're going to begin in verse 1. Joshua started early the next morning and left the Achaia Grove with all the Israelites. <clears throat> they went as far as the Jordan and stayed there before crossing. After three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God carried by the Levitical priest, you are to break camp and follow it. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between yourselves and the Ark don't go near it so that you can see the way to go, for you haven't traveled this way before. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, because the Lord will do wonders among you tomorrow. Then he said to the priest, <clears throat> Carry the Ark of the Covenant and go ahead of the people. So they carried the Ark of the Covenant and went ahead of them. The Lord spoke to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of, the, of, is, of all Israel. So they will know that I will be with you just as I was with Moses. Command the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant when you reach the edge of the water, stand in the Jordan. Then Joshua told the Israelites, come closer and listen to the words of the Lord your God. He said, you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly dispossess before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Gergashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. When the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of the whole earth goes ahead of you into the Jordan. Now choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man for each tribe. When the feet of the priest who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of the whole earth, come to rest in the Jordan's water, its water will be cut off. The water flowing downstream will stand up in a mass. When the people broke camp across the Jordan, the priest carried the Ark of the Covenant ahead of the people. Now the Jordan overflows its banks throughout the harvest season. But as soon as the priests carrying the ark reached the Jordan, their feet touched the water at its edge, and the water flowing downstream stood still, rising up in a mass that extended as far as Adam, a city next to Zarathem. The water flowing downstream into the Sea of the Arabah, the Dead Sea, was completely cut off, and the people crossed opposite Jericho. The priest carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant stood firmly on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel crossed on dry ground until the entire nation had finished crossing the Jordan. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, I thank you so much for um, the accounts in Scripture of how you have worked in people's lives, uh, their failures and their strengths but also your miraculous working uh, to remind us of the possibilities in our own lives and how you can work miraculously here. Lord, I pray that this morning you will bring these truths to heart and to light. Uh, we thank you so much for the way that you are working, the way that you continue to provide. We ask you to use the scripture this morning to encourage and to convict Holy Spirit, who will work here today, and please help me in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. By the way, <clears throat> I meant to mention a couple minutes ago of another way the Lord worked this past week. Um, Mark had suggested to Howard, why don't you get a, another drum set, one that you can leave out in the pavilion. You don't have to haul back and forth each week. I see how heavy yours is and such. And so Howard started looking on Facebook or FaceTime or whatever to see about finding one and ended up finding this, uh, got it at a very discounted price. 
and went to pick it up. The lady was in tears for the money that she was able to receive for it, but also that it was going to a church and the church would be blessed for it. And um, Howard and Mark ended up praying for the lady as Howard was driving home. I love to see Amen. God work. Amen. And he does it all the time. Now, can you imagine can you imagine the Lord leading you into a river and having the water of that river in flood season stack up beside you so that you could walk through on dry ground? Can you imagine having the Lord miraculously preparing your way? Working in ways that the rest of the world could not understand, could not comprehend. God working miraculously. In verse 4 of this passage, we read, But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between yourselves and the ark. Don't go near it so that you can see the way to go, for you haven't traveled this way before. You have not passed this way before. There are many places we have not been before. And in many of those places, we do not know where to go or how to respond or what to do because we have not been that way before. You're going to a new school. You're attending a school for the first time, but you have not been that way before. You're starting a new career, you're starting a new job, but you have not been that way before. You're getting married, a new spouse, but you have not traveled that way before. You're buying a new house, but you have not traveled that way before. You're moving to a new place, a new area, but you have not been that way before. You're retiring and going to have more free time and you're going to be around the house more often. But you've not been that way before. You're getting older and having more physical problems. <laughs> but you've not been that way before. And suddenly, where there was laughter and there were two in the home, and now there's quiet. And there's only one. For one that you have built your life around is no longer there. And you have not been that way before. In verse 5, we read Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourself. Because the Lord will do wonders among you tomorrow. Joshua says, you've not been this way before. But God is going to do miracles among you tomorrow. I don't know about you. But I want the Lord to do miracles among me. Especially when I'm heading to an area I've not been in before. Especially when I have no idea where I'm going or what I'm doing. I want the Lord to do miracles among me. The other morning, Drew was sitting across the table from me in Colorado, working. When I started working on this message. All of a sudden I started crying. He said, Daddy, what's the matter? Why are you crying? And 
I told him I just started thinking. The creator of the universe, knowing me, wanting to do miracles in my life. And I turned over to YouTube and pulled up the video of Sandy Patty, where she sings angels watching over me. And I just started crying uncontrollably. To think that the creator of the universe knows me and cares about me and wants to be intimately involved in my life. Can you imagine God knowing us and caring enough about us to want to work in our lives? It's easy in this world, in the form of people around us, in neighborhoods and communities where folks seem to ignore us or overlook us, or places where we seem to have little or no impact, to begin to think that no one knows and no one sees us and no one cares. But my friend, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 10, aren't two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's consent. But even the hairs of your head have all been counted, so don't be afraid you are worth more than many sparrows. My friend, I want you to know that God knows you. And you are important. To him. So in verse 4 of this passage we read, Consecrate yourselves because you have not passed this way before. In verse 5 we read, Tomorrow the Lord will do miracles among you. How do we go from you have not been this way before to tomorrow God will do miracles among you? I believe there are several steps we need to follow to have the Lord doing miracles in our life. First, we need to talk to the Lord about it. We need to pray. All through this process, Joshua and the Lord have been talking. Now, how did Joshua know the Lord was going to do miracles in their midst the next day? He knew it because he and the Lord had been talking about it. It amazes me the number of people who want the Lord to work miracles in their lives, who never talk to the Lord about it, who never ask Him, who never share their difficulties, their trials, their frustrations, their setbacks. Does God know everything? Yes, He does. But He wants to talk to you about it. And He wants you to talk to Him about it. In Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 7, Jesus said, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find Knock and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Who among you, if a son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? What did Jesus say? He said, your father in heaven wants to give good gifts to his children. If you are a child of his, then ask. Pray about it. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray and what we call the Lord's Prayer, what did he tell them to pray? Our Father. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 15, we read, For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, Instead, you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. What good dad doesn't want to do good things and give good things to his children? The Bible says when you become a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are adopted into the family of God. The Lord becomes your father and he delights in giving good gifts to his children. This is a good place for an amen. Amen. When you become a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are adopted into the family of God, and God loves 
to bless his children and give good gifts to his children. How do we find miracles when we've not been this way before? You talk to God about it. You pray. Second, look what Joshua told the people to do there in verse 5. Look there again with me, please. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves because the Lord will do wonders among you tomorrow. Joshua told them to consecrate themselves. The word translated here as consecrate is the Hebrew word kadash. Now, Landon, that's not crawdad. It's kadash. <laughs> it means to consecrate, to sanctify, to prepare, to dedicate, to be hallowed, to be holy, to be sanctified, to be separate. In other words, prepare yourself. Make yourself clean, and that can only be done through a relationship with Jesus Christ. We address the sin in our lives. We confess them so that God can work through us. In Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, we read, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. What does Isaiah say? He's saying God's arm's not so short that he can't reach you. He's not so weak that he can't perform miracles in your life. It is the sin in your life keeping him from working miracles. Deal with the sin then step back and watch him work. So many times we sabotage ourselves because we're only lukewarm, half-hearted Christians. Kind of following God, but not wholeheartedly. We want God, but we want him on our terms. That's not the way it works. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13, we read, You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. We deal with the sin in our lives and make him a priority in our lives. We don't say, I want a promotion with a side order of God. We say, I want God. And then let the chips fall where they will. Talk to the Lord about it. Second, pray about it. Or deal with the issues in your life. And third, make sure you have no will in the matter. Up to this point, God has been leading the Israelites with a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night. Every morning they'd get up and they'd step outside their tent and they'd look toward the pillar. Which way is the Lord leading today or is the pillar staying still so that we remain where we are? The Israelites had no say in the situation. They had no will in the situation. They went where God told them to go when he told them to go. We reach a point in our lives where we have no will in the situation. Lord, you tell me what you want done. Because I know that you want the best for me. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus, thinking about what was coming ahead of him, think about all of the sin of the world and think of the nastiest sin you can think about, all of the sin in the world being placed upon him. And for the first time in all of eternity, Jesus being separated from his Father. And Jesus didn't want to go through that. And he said, Lord, Daddy, please take this cup away. But not my will, but yours be done. We have to reach a point where we have no will in the matter. Henry Blackaby, in his study, Experiencing God, Knowing and Doing the Will of God, says, when you seek, when you're seeking to know God's will, you have to reach a point where you have no will in the matter. If you want to know God's will, you need to reach a point where you can say, Lord, however you want to work in this situation is fine with me. If you want me to have that promotion, fine. If you don't, that's fine as well. I trust you in this situation. Wednesday night, I watched the movie Dune on the airplane on the way back. I've never watched it before. In the movie, one of the bad guys asked, when is a gift not a gift? If you've watched the movie, you know the emperor sent a whole nation to a planet 
supposedly giving them the opportunity to become very wealthy, when in fact he was setting them up for failure, he was setting them up for destruction. We don't know what each situation will bring us. We don't know how things are going to work out in a situation. We think we do, but we don't. And so we, in each situation, we have to reach a point where we can trust the Lord. Ms. Billy Graham once said, if God had answered all of her prayers, she would have married the wrong man several times. We have to reach a point where we trust the Lord in the situation. Lord, I think this promotion would be great. But this may not be the time. This may not be the company. I trust you. And fourth, you delight yourself in the Lord. Psalm 37 verse 4, we read, Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Many people like to quote the last part of that verse, but they miss the first part. The Lord will give you the desires of your heart if you delight yourself in the Lord. And what does it mean to delight yourself in the Lord? It means to spend time with Him in prayer and Bible study, meditation, praise and worship. If we delight ourselves in the Lord, our minds and thinking becomes more and more like the Lord. And so it becomes easier and easier to do the things He wants done. A couple days ago I was visiting with Bonnie's dad, her sister, and brother-in-law. They told me about visiting near Zion National Park. They spoke to a realtor while they were there and asked her what land was going for there. She told them that she had just sold a postage stamp sized lot with a camper on it for $800,000. <laughs> Somebody wanted a place to stay when they came to the area to visit. The realtor told her that the people who worked in the area couldn't afford to live in the area. And then Bonnie's sister asked me, do you think they are any happier than we are? I told her, no, I'm happily married to my best friend, serving the Lord and watching him work. It doesn't get any better than that. Delighting yourself in the Lord affects your mind, your way of thinking, and helps you keep things in perspective. Allows you to see things the way that Lord, the Lord does and to value the things that He values. And fifth, you want to see the Lord lead you in uncertain times, do miracles, be sure and give God the credit. Look there again, if you will, please, verse 5. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves because the Lord will do wonders among you tomorrow. What did Joshua say? He said, You're going to see the Lord do miracles among you. He didn't try to claim credit for what was about to happen. He didn't blow his own horn and say, Look what I caused to happen. He said, Step back and watch the Lord work. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6, we read, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy paths. The Lord promises to direct our paths, but it is conditional. It is conditional upon us giving him the glory, seeking his face, and pointing other people to him. It breaks my heart when I see the Lord working in someone's life, and they begin to get the big head, and they begin to blow their horn, and say, look at what I have done, and all of a sudden the Lord's hand is removed from them because they're trying to claim credit for what God is doing. Be sure and give God the credit. And six, watch the Lord work miracles. The Lord told Joshua, have the priests carry the Ark of the Covenant into the river. He said, the, the water will dry up when their feet touch the edge of the river. Poor Joshua didn't know any better than to take God at his word. He had the priest take the Ark of the Covenant and start walking to the river. Can you imagine being one of the priests? <laughs> you, you know this river's flooding, right? Joshua's like, yeah, I know. You know it's flowing pretty good, right? Yeah, yeah, I know. 
Uh, Joshua, you feel how close we're getting to the water? Ain't nothing happening yet. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Lord said, when your foot touches the water, it'll dry up. And the priest walked and walked. They got to the edge of those flood waters and went to step his, put his foot in the edge of that water and the water parted. Can you imagine? The generation before had seen God part the Red Sea, but they wouldn't trust the Lord. And so they missed out on blessing. This generation got the opportunity to see God do a miracle again and stack the water up beside them. I'm glad my brother-in-law wasn't there. I'm sure he would have taken a fishing pole and thrown it in there as they went by. <laughs> them poor people didn't know any better than to trust God and Walk to the river, go to step his foot. <laughs> you know, the priest in the front's probably saying to the guy in the back, You want to switch places? Yeah. <laughs> they step to the edge of the water, and it stands up beside him, doing a miracle. Some of y'all know my niece, Melinda. I'd like to share with you a testimony of hers in her own words. So my mom and I took a trip to Seattle to meet with my potential employers and to see the area that neither of us had visited ever before. I took a scary leap of faith and somehow agreed to the job and moved to Washington in one fell swoop after having peace during conversations with managers and tours of the location. Immediately after agreeing to the job out here, my mom and I realized that the next step would be housing. Also on our mind were the churches in the area, thinking that these could be potential communities for me to serve and grow in. As we continued to pass by a certain church in town, Life Point Community Church, I felt a draw in my spirit to it. When we stopped by and determined no one was in the building, I called and left a message for the pastor. Not long after that, we were... Uh, on an hour and a half long phone call with Pastor Curtis of Life Point as he shared the story of his church and his role in that church. And I shared my story of eerie peace about this move. My heart felt at peace with everything he said and described. By the end of the call, my mom mentioned to Pastor Curtis that I was in need of a place to live and if he knew anyone in need of a tenant, it would be very helpful. He said he would spread the word and help in any way he could. My mom and I continued to drive around, whatever that town is, and the surrounding cities looking at available rooms and apartments to rent and exploring this soon-to-be new home of mine. We found ourselves on the ridge and being self-aware that she has a pennant to worry about me, my mom decided to pray a big prayer that went something like this. God, I thank you for this opportunity you have provided for Melinda to move to this beautiful place and be a light here. Right now we have a need to find her a place to live. I pray that you provide a woman who has a room to rent. I pray that this woman is a Christian and loves you. I pray that she has a welcoming home for Melinda to stay in and God wouldn't it be nice if it were in this neighborhood here. Amen. The next day, we received an email from a woman named Jennifer who had a room to rent and heard about me through Pastor Curtis. We went to go visit her and see her beautiful home that evening. She was a kind Christian lady who told us of how a girl would be moving out of her room a few days before I would be needing it, and I was welcome to come rent it. We immediately knew she was an answered prayer. And as we walked back to our car from Jennifer's home, we realized that we were in the same neighborhood where my mom had prayed her big prayer. I now live and work in that town and attend Life Point Community Church. I've seen countless connections and timings with people and living situations that continue to affirm that God has me here intentionally. He would be a good God and worthy of my praise regardless, but I am grateful that he is faithful in all circumstances, including this one. So when we were visiting, another couple reached down after having heard from Pastor Curtis 
They said they were finishing construction of a mother-in-law suite attached to their home, but had not yet decided what they were going to do with it. My mom and I met them and saw the work in progress. Such a sweet family who attended Life Point. I was just glad to have made another contact, regardless of what would happen with their beautiful mother-in-law suite. A few days later, they emailed me back saying they had prayed about it and wanted to offer me the opportunity to rent it. But it wouldn't be done until two months after I moved to town. It just so happened that Ms. Jennifer, who I had agreed to rent a room from, needed me out after two months for another girl to move in through a previous agreement. I now live in that mother-in-law suite and just renewed my lease for another six months with this amazing family that I go to church with and respect tremendously. They are grateful to me for renting as well, recognizing that they could be renting to some or many strangers had they gone with some of their original plans. Who knows what these people would respect them and their family, let alone have a personal relationship with Jesus. I'd like to say it was coincidence. But it's so clear to me that this was God's providence. I love to see God work. You've never been this way before. Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do a miracle in your week, in your midst. Every week as we close Mission Possible Camp at the end of the evening, I close by shouting, if you do your best, and the kids answer, God will do the rest. If you do your best, God will do the rest. And my friends, that is what Joshua is saying here. You've never been this way before. But if you do your best, if you do what the Lord has already told you to do, then step back and let the Lord do the rest. Let's try that together. If you do your best, if you do your best, God will do the rest. Father God, thank you for the promise, the knowledge, the certainty that you are in control of all things, that you know and love your children, that you look for the opportunity to good, do good things in our lives. Lord, help us to do our part so that you can do yours. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.